I'm going to look at Daniel chapter 2. I'll read verses 1 through 19. Uh, This morning we'll look at half of this chapter and then pick up the rest of it, God willing, the next time we're together. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 19. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. It's interesting as you read Daniel how many little things like that have nice little rings to them. This is how the text is designed. The king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. It's a little, it's put together that way so it sounds kind of interesting. Be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream. And my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn from limb to limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, or I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The king that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. And Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the chief's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? And Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and his companions, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And the mystery was revealed to Daniel. And in a vision of the night, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Let's have prayer. Father, we pray for your blessing upon our time as we gather around your word and we seek to learn from it. Strengthen us and bless us. We pray, save sinners with the Holy Spirit of God. Do his work among us, showing himself to be effectual within our hearts. And your church might be edified that we might be drawn to the one true Christ whose blood was shed for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So we're in the book of Daniel. You know this by now. And the book of Daniel was written during the Hebrew period of exile, the Judean exile. Southern Israel was in exile. They were taken into exile by the Babylonians. And this was in the 6th century B.C. when this all occurred. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon at this time. Babylon is the greatest city that had ever been built up until now. 
And the kingdom of Babylonia is the greatest kingdom and the dominant kingdom in the civilized world, the ancient Near East. Daniel, however, is rising, he's a prophet, and he's rising to prominence in Nebuchadnezzar's court. He's a Jew, he's been taken captive, essentially a slave in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king that ever lived over the this great and mighty kingdom, Babylonia, in the city of Babylon, Daniel is rising to a position of prominence within the king's court. And last week, Daniel provoked a crisis. He refused to eat Nebuchadnezzar's food under the threat, essentially, of a death sentence, at least to the man who was responsible for feeding them, but we can assume that if that man was to be executed by Nebuchadnezzar for not feeding them the right food. Certainly, Daniel would have been executed by Nebuchadnezzar for not eating the right food. Gives you some insight into Daniel's situation, and it gives you some insight into how dangerous the ancient Near Eastern courts were, particularly the court of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel provoked a crisis by refusing to eat the king's food. And God intervened in this crisis, demonstrating his power, and really demonstrating his power and showing his light for the first time in several generations because up until now, everything had been in decline. And now in a moment, there's a flash of light. And what do we see? God still cares for his people. God's still on the move. And God's still ruling and interceding in the affairs of men. And he has supremacy even over this great king and kingdom of Babylon. Daniel's provoked crisis leads to a wonderful demonstration of God's power that we really haven't seen in a while as the history of the Bible has played out. And today, I believe the text explains how Daniel rose to power in those ancient Near Eastern courts. If you look up in chapter 1 and verse 19 through 20, it says, And the king spoke with them, speaking of Daniel and his friends, among all of them, none was found like Dan Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which this king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And so, that is stated is Daniel 1 kind of wraps up. And I think it is almost a prologue into Daniel 2 because Daniel 2 then explains how these men demonstrated their competency in interpreting dreams and providing wisdom for this great king. So Daniel 2, I believe, explains the epilogue of Daniel 1, which essentially is a prologue to Daniel 2. Today's text is part of a larger story, however. I mean, the larger story is the story of Daniel, and the even larger story is the story of the Bible. But the larger story of which I speak is the larger story of the second chapter of Daniel. So the second chapter is a large story. And I believe that verses 1 through 19 are a smaller story within the context of a larger story. So we're reading today the beginning of a larger story, which is all of Daniel 2. But this is a small story within a larger story that includes the entire chapter. Small story is verses 1 through 19. The larger story is the whole chapter. I'll look at the first half of the chapter this week, and God willing, the next time we're together, we'll look at the second half of the chapter and conclude the larger story. Today's story is a rescue mission. Daniel and his three friends are in danger. Their lives are in danger. Last week's story, Daniel refused to do something. He refused to eat. This week's story, Daniel volunteers to do something. He volunteers to interpret the king's dream, and thereby God himself intervenes on a rescue mission to rescue Daniel and his three friends. It's a rescue story. Daniel res or God rescues, he uses Daniel to rescue Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The entire story, though all this is a subplot, the rescue mission is a subplot, the entire story is a story of Nebuchadnezzar going from ignorance to wisdom. This is where we'll get next time we're together, God willing. 
So while we have this little subplot of a rescue mission, Daniel being used by God to rescue him and his three friends in Nebuchadnezzar's court by Daniel volunteering to interpret the dream and God giving him the ability to do so, the next time we are together, we'll see that this smaller rescue mission is part of a larger story, which is of Nebuchadnezzar going from ignorance to wisdom and insight. Goes from ignorance to wisdom and insight. The greatest king that ever lived up until this point, I guess you could say, the most powerful king at least. The greatest kingdom, the most powerful kingdom, goes from ignorance to insight. And he goes from ignorance of his place within God's unfolding plan, which is a mystery, to insight of all of a sudden knowing that he has a place in God's unfolding plan and that the kingdom of God is superior to the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. That's what Nebuchadnezzar advances to in chapter 2. But we'll look at that part next time together. Today's story is a rescue story. And really today's story, if you want to boil it down, as far as the main application of the sermon, is a call to prayer. What does Daniel and his three friends do, Daniel specifically, in this crisis? They're all going to die. Their lives are being held in the balance. They're looking straight at death, and Nebuchadnezzar is about to rip their limbs off, literally. And under threat of having their limbs ripped off, what happens is they cast themselves on the mercy of God in prayer. And so today is a call to prayer. God answered their prayer. And so I want to challenge you today. So when you face your difficult situations at work, you face your difficult decisions that you have to make in your family, and you look at the decay of our nation and the problems that you have, what I want you to do is I want you to cast yourself on the mercy of God in prayer because this is the most potent weapon you have against your enemies. It's prayer. And so many Christians neglect this. They try to figure things out with their own ingenuity. And Daniel's gut reaction is to pray and to call his friends to prayer. So many Christians fail in this regard because they think their wisdom is greater than God's wisdom. Today is a call to pray and to trust God in danger because God is a God who can do what the false gods can't. He actually rescues his people in response to their prayers. So let me outline the text today. I'll give you the outline. Number one, pivots on three points. Nebuchadnezzar's religion fails miserably. That's in verses 1 through 11. We see the impotency of the, well, the kingdom of Babylon is great. We see the impotency of the religion when it stands against the power of God. Number two, Nebuchadnezzar wants Daniel dead. He's coming for him. The most powerful king on earth has his sights fixed on God's humble servant Daniel, and he wants him dead, verses 12 through 13. And then in the third point is that God prevails. Daniel's God prevails, verses 14 through 19. Nebuchadnezzar's religion fails. Nebuchadnezzar wants Daniel dead. Daniel's God prevails. And it all comes together as a mission of rescue whereby these men cast themselves on the mercy of God in prayer and God answers. When you're in danger or when the people of God are in danger, our first response should be to pray. God, forgive us for the times we don't. And have mercy on us for the times that we think that we can get our way outside of the mercy of God through our own means and the strong arm of the flesh. But let's look at this. Nebuchadnezzar's religion fails. Really, Nebuchadnezzar's religion fails and Daniel's religion triumphs. This is the message of today. Triumphs by prayer. Nebuchadnezzar's religion fails. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man in the ancient Near East, the ancient world. His kingdom is Babylon, the most powerful empire of the world to date. Military might, prosperity and financial ease. Beautiful city towering temples to their false gods, glazed streets with the images of lions and dragons and bulls, 
glazed in the streets and in the city walls which surround the city, and the city surrounded by a moat with the beautiful Euphrates River running through it and nourishing the city, and his legendary hanging gardens. And the kingdom of Babylon, the city of Babel, King Nebuchadnezzar have their own idolatrous religion. And in this text, we watch that religion of this mighty city fail, utterly fail, as a massive fight erupts between Nebuchadnezzar and his, I guess you could call them religious leaders. A huge fight erupts within the palace courts. This conflict between the king and his religious experts, his experts, and it's all precipitated by a dream. A dream provokes this whole crisis. Look at verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. It's all precipitated by dreams. His spirit is troubled. He had a dream that was so bad, it troubled his spirit. Now, it's obvious from the text that not all of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams troubled him. In fact, I think you could probably assume that this is the first dream to trouble him. Perhaps. It's the first one noted in Scripture, at least. So this wasn't a regular occurrence, and that's why the dream was so troubling, because this was abnormal for him. This wasn't the norm for his dreams to provoke this level of crisis within his mind and heart. So not all dreams troubled him to this degree. This was a special dream. And this special dream penetrated the recesses of his mind and heart. It was deeply lodged within there. He couldn't shut it out. I don't know how many of you wake up in the morning or in the night and you're in the middle of a dream. Alarm goes off and you have a dream and then it quickly vanishes. And you forget about it. What was that dream? And there's a few characters in it, but then afterwards it's all gone. It's funny how the mind plays games on you and recounts the thoughts of the day or the challenges that you face. Well, well, this dream wasn't like that. It wasn't, it wasn't a mist that vanishes. It was something that troubled him for literally days, weeks. It was really bothering him. And for a man of this stature and this power to admit that he was disheveled, and tripped up by a dream, he's, he's, he's admitting this to his royal court is a big deal. Because I think they'd like to see, he'd like them to see him as strong and powerful and not a guy who can be thrown off balance by a dream. Well, he's thrown off balance by a dream. As Calvin said of this, he said, Nebuchadnezzar was divinely tormented by this dream. Very great terror had seized upon his mind. God penetrated his sleep, his mind and his sleep. And a king of this power is going to have his palace and his place where he sleeps, because there's people who want to kill him. He's going to have it surrounded by royal guards, the best trained guards you could find, money can buy. He's going to make sure that he's protected and there's multiple checks and balances. But isn't it something that despite the army and the guards that would have surrounded him and their, their impressive military might and their tact and their training, they could not prevent God from penetrating into this man's dreams. God got around them very quickly. And he got into his head and into his heart and troubled him. And from this we can gather as we look at Nebuchadnezzar's religion failing from this we can gather that when we are dealing with our enemies, and the church of Jesus Christ has enemies, when we are dealing with our enemies, some of you have enemies that attack you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. They hate you. There are people that literally hate this church because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And they are around. There's, there's not a handful of them. There's a good number of them that literally hate us. And there's people that literally hate you because of your faith. When dealing with these enemies, it's important for us to take comfort in the fact that we have no idea how God is tormenting them silently in their thoughts and in their minds. Their conscience is being afflicted and their dreams perhaps being afflicted by God Almighty. How God is tormenting their private lives with restless thoughts that keep them awake at night. So keep that in mind. 
It's a way that God actually works to our advantage. The, the scriptures tell us in Proverbs 10, verse 24, that what the wicked dreads will come upon him. It's almost like the wicked know, consciously know or subconsciously know, that they should be afraid. And so they're always a little jumpy at times. Proverbs 28, verse 1 says, the wicked flee when no one pursues. Their, their consciences torment them in their sleep. Wicked people are jumpy and suspicious because they don't have God to look to as their strong rock and fortress. They're relying on their own strength. And so this is where Nebuchadnezzar is, the most powerful man in the world, the, this great and glorious city of Babylon and the Babylonian Empire, living on the edge in his thoughts, edgy. Not in like he's pushing the limits, but he is on edge. He's, he's borderline unhinged intellectually, mentally, psychologically. And God often torments the thoughts of the wicked, especially those who present themselves as enemies of his people. He'll put people into their lives. He'll give them thoughts. He'll sink deep thoughts into their hearts that just gnaw away at their insides. They flee when no one pursues. They're, they come across as strong, but really in the inside, they're marshmallows. And this dream torments this powerful man. If you could imagine, this powerful man under this great fortress in this great city surrounded by great armies, protected by great and mighty men, is tormented by a dream. He's not tormented by a guy who's trying to poison his food. He's not tormented by an invading army. He's not tormented by an insurrection in his city. He's not even tormented by a palace coup. He's tormented by a dream, something in his imagination. This is how weak the wicked are, although they present themselves as strong. Tormented in his imagination. And so what Nebuchadnezzar does is what any ruler would do is he summons the government experts to solve his problems. Nebuch or Daniel chapter 2, verse 2, he summons the experts. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king. The magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, the best experts that tax dollars can buy specializing in their enchanted junk science. He surrounds himself with these sycophants that present themselves in expertise of dream interpretation, essentially witchcraft, all consistent and compatible with the satanic religion of Babylon. Babylon had its own satanic religion, and, and they did put a lot of credence in dreams. They put a lot of credence in the stars, too, and they were very superstitious people. And so these experts, the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans earned their presence uh, in the court of the king by likely being sycophants, and they, I suspect, were graduates of Nebuchadnezzar's academy, top of their class. So... If you go by, back to chapter 1, verse 5, and you look at the end of the chapter, Daniel and his three friends were assigned to be part of this academy. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Well, in verse 2, then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So these men were educated in Nebuchadnezzar's public school program to learn the ways of the Babylonians. And they were experts, not only in their own right, but they were the ones that exceeded their classmates in Babylonian, Babylonian education and Nebuchadnezzar's specially designed school. So keep that in mind. The men that are standing before Nebuchadnezzar in his court to interpret his dreams are the fruit of Nebuchadnezzar's educational system. He groomed them and trained them for this very day. 
And so he's about to find out in this crisis that he's in how useless his educational system is and how useless the religion is that underpins it. Because this is what it's produced. Hollow, empty men. Vain men. Shadows and phantoms who are incapable of solving the king's greatest problem. The best experts that money can buy. Graduates of his three-year education program. This was a test for Babylonian education right here. And what we find out is the test goes through is that the education that Daniel and his friends received in Judea was greater than the education that they received in Babylon with the underpinnings of God's law. Because their Judean education, what did it teach them to do? It taught them to cast themselves on the mercy of God. And that's where they find wisdom. Daniel's friends. But these guys are useless that are standing before the king. And so what you have as they stand before the king is you have this back and forth conversation between Nebuchadnezzar and this conglomerate of magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. And the, this reaches a level 10 very fast. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly this escalates, this back and forth conflict. I don't think these Babylonian sycophants saw this coming. Up until now, they'd been honored. Here's a degree on your wall and a set of glasses. You guys must be really smart. You're working in the king's court. Boy, you look smart. And so they, they, and they had a, you know, a cushy job. They didn't, they didn't see this coming. And all of a sudden, the crisis rises, and they melt, quite literally. Well, Nebuchadnezzar explains the problem in verse 3. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Now, the experts offer a solution in verse 4. And the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Verse 4 onward in the book of Daniel. So the book of Daniel is structured differently from any other book in the Bible. Chapter 2, verse 4 to the end of chapter 7 is not originally in the language of Hebrew. It's in the language of Aramaic, where everything before chapter 2, verse 4, and everything after chapter 7, so 8 onward, is in the language of Hebrew, but everything in between from here forward to the end of chapter 7 is in the language of Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of the day. It was the language of the common man. So now if you want to travel anywhere in the world, you can typically get by by knowing English. In, in Roman times, it, it, was, it was Latin. In Greek times, it was Greek. Well, in this, these times, it's Aramaic. And so now the book moves into this language of Aramaic as the original language in which it was written away from the Hebrew for several chapters. And they want to know, these magicians and enchanters and sorcerers, they want to know what the king's dream was, and then they're going to interpret the dream for him. Then they'll interpret it. Then they'll showcase their expertise, but not until the king gives them some information. And Nebuchadnezzar does not like that. He loathes that idea. Look at verse 5. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb and your houses shall be laid in ruins. He sees through their mumbo jumbo and their hocus pocus. I mean, it's a bit of a fraud, right? If you, interpret, if you can interpret my dream, you should be able to tell me my dream. You guys can't tell me my dream, so how do I know you're not making the interpretation up? You guys are full of hocus pocus and mumbo jumbo. And so Nebuchadnezzar cuts through the hocus pocus and the mumbo jumbo, and he calls them on it. And he wants them to tell him the dream and interpret it. And if they don't, you heard it right here. If you don't tell me what my dream is, I'm going to rip your arms and your legs off your body, and I'm going to bulldoze your house. Does that give you some insight into Nebuchadnezzar's character? What a man. Wow. This is, this is organized crime taking over government office. Do not cross this man. It provides some insight into his temperament. But he doesn't stop there. I mean, he at least sweetens the pot a little bit in verse 6 where it says, But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. You don't, you don't tell me what the dream is and the interpretation. I'll rip off your arms and legs and bulldoze your houses. 
But hey, if you show me the dream and the interpretation, I'll make you wealthy and happy and prominent in my kingdom. So why wouldn't you show him the dream and the interpretation? Why won't you do it? Like, this is, this is the best dream interpretation money can buy. Right here. But we find out clearly that his money can't buy dream interpretation. It can't buy a miracle. It can't buy this level of wisdom. These are, this is the deep wisdom of God. And so the experts insist upon their solution. Tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. Verse 7. They answered a second time. See, it's erupting. It's starting to escalate here. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation again. Like, just trust our mumbo jumbo and our hocus pocus. Don't you know? Well, you must tell us and then we will interpret. The king calls their, them liars and digs in. Verse 8 to 9. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. You clowns are just buying time. I want the interpretation and I want it now. And if you don't give it to me now, you're dead. And your family's inheritance is ruined. So now is where I want it. And then in verse 9, he says, If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. Limbs torn off, homes bulldozed. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. You bunch of low-life liars, he calls them. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation. He doesn't believe them. And by the way, verse 11, in, in what follows here, the experts say what he's asking of them is impossible. And by them acknowledging that this is an impossible request, tell us the dream and interpret it, as opposed to just, I'll give you the dream and you interpret it. By them acknowledging this is an impossible request, they're really teeing Daniel up. In verse 10 and 11, what I'm about to read, is not only are they saying that the king is asking the impossible of them, but they're also throwing God a slow pitch with a beach ball. Well, look at what it says. Verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter in Chaldean, or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Do you see how they're teeing Daniel up here? They're, they're throwing a slow pitch to God with a, base, with a beach ball? What they're essentially saying is no man on the face of the earth can do what you're asking us to do, but only the gods can do this. In other words, these men who are the experts in their religion and their superstition of Babylon and in their idolatry are men who do not have access to their gods. Their religion is futile. Either that or their gods do not speak. Their gods are deaf and dumb and blind. One or the other. They are either failures because they don't have access to their gods or their gods are failures because their gods are dumb and deaf and blind. One or the other. <coughs> but either way, their religion is a failure. Their th way of thinking, their religious system is a total flop. And so this entire confrontation that escalates and escalates and escalates and begins with the dream, and then it's Nebuchadnezzar saying, tell me my dream and interpret my dream, and the guys are going back and forth with them. All of this serves one purpose, and it serves to demonstrate, to confirm, that Nebuchadnezzar's religion, his educational system, the superstitions that he's based his empire on, is all hot air. It's nothing. It's smoke and mirrors. And he flies off the handle into a mad rage. Moving on to our second point, as part of that mad rage, Nebuchadnezzar wants Daniel dead. Verse 12 and 13. Nebuchadnezzar, for some reason, lumps Daniel and company, his three friends, 
in with all the others to rip off their limbs. Now, it's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar never consulted Daniel and his three friends. He just lumps them all together. So it tells me they really haven't distinguished themselves from the three friends just yet, or from the other men just yet, the enchanters and the wizards and whatever you have you. They haven't distinguished themselves from those men. They haven't come to the head of the class yet. But they were lumped in with them, so they evidently were educated with them in this educational program that Nebuchadnezzar designed. Verse 12 and 13, Nebuchadnezzar lumps them all in together, and he's about to rip off their limbs too. Verse 12, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Daniel wasn't even given the chance to account or recount or interpret the dream. Uh, this is like, they, as I said, they, they graduated from the re-education program with these other guys. They were part of that three-year class, likely. And the expert's ineptness puts Nebuchadnezzar over the edge, so much so that the guys who he considered the top of the class, because they're inept, Nebuchadnezzar's going to kill the whole class. And Daniel and his friends are part of the class. As John Gill says, This threw him, Nebuchadnezzar, into an excess of wrath and fury, which in those tyrannical and despotic princes was exceeding great and terrible. Yes, that is true. Now, we can lament the present state of our government and how terrible they are, and they are terrible in so many ways for so many reasons, especially with some of the bills that they're trying to pass right now and some of the ways that they treat us and have treated us. But we can also be grateful that we don't live under this type of a regime, now, we know where things progress if, they don't, if you don't put the brakes on them. This is ultimately where Satan takes them, but we can be grateful that right now we're not living under this level of despotic tyranny, which is, way, which is the way government goes without the grace of God in it. It, it becomes raw power. And Nebuchadnezzar, is a, it's a graceless government. No grace of God in this government, no power of God in this government, so it's raw human muscle and force. And while providing insight into Nebuchadnezzar's character, this certainly does, it demonstrates how much the dream vexed and agitated him. This dream is really getting to him. He said, look, he's designed a three-year educational program to essentially train the top men Within the Babylonian Empire, for the royal court, he's invested all of this time into this educational program. Its religious underpinnings are the same religion that he would hold dear as the king of Babylon. And he's willing to kill and slaughter every single student in this three-year program because the top of the class can't interpret his dream. Do you think this dream bothered him a little bit? It's really gotten deep into his heart and mind. It is troubling him. Very greatly, he is vexed and significantly agitated. So he, Nebuchadnezzar, has now provoked a crisis. It's not Daniel that's provoked the crisis this time. It's Nebuchadnezzar that's provoked the crisis. And the crisis is, God's people are in Nebuchadnezzar's court. What will come of Daniel and his three friends? He's going to kill them. Certainly they can't interpret dreams, can they? Will they perish in the Babylonian court? Is this the end? And not only will they perish in the Babylonian court, and is this the end of Daniel and his three friends, but aren't you just a little curious about this dream? All we're talking about is this dream that sent the great king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar himself, into this vexed rage. I'm really curious about the dream, aren't you? What was this dream about? And if you're curious, don't you think Nebuchadnezzar's curious? If you want to know what the dream was about, you have to come back next time. Right? We're not getting to this this week. But, but this dream is really bugging him. It's agitating him to the nth degree. Will he ever learn about it? Well, the crisis erupts, and the crisis is that Nebuchadnezzar wants Daniel dead. He wants Daniel's three friends dead. The Jews in the royal court, dead. The top men of Israel, dead. In this pagan heathen court. What happens next? Well, Nebuchadnezzar's religion has clearly failed. His religious education system has clearly failed. It's, it's a sham. It's hot air. He 
can't stand the test in a crisis. And what happens next is God providentially uses this crisis not only to show the emptiness and hollowness of Nebuchadnezzar's system that he's created, but to show that Daniel's God is the one who prevails. By the way, this is what we're doing right now as a church. Why are we investing money and time and effort into educating children scripturally? Why are you doing that in, in your home schools? Why are we doing that at King Alfred Academy? Why do we care so much about teaching people biblical truth? Well, we believe that this biblical truth underpins the very existence of the world. And when the time of crisis comes, that is when the wood, hay, and stubble is burnt away. And that which is gold and precious metals is which lasts through the fire. And you're seeing that here. In the moment of crisis, it's the fake that dies. It's the true that's exalted. The good, the true, and the beautiful will be exalted. And the fake and the fraudulent will be burned in the fire. And in this moment of crisis, what is it that lasts? It's that which has been built on the foundation of God's word. Daniel and his three friends that were trained primarily as young men in Judean religion and wisdom in the royal courts of Israel and maintained a fear of the Lord. And these hocus-pocus sycophants show themselves to be nothing more than a vapor in hot air. Daniel's God prevails, verses 14 through 19. Daniel speaks to the man butcher, the hatchet man himself, in verse 14. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Now, look, notice the prudence and discretion there. How do I know Daniel was raised and educated in Hebrew Jewish wisdom? Well, because he operated with prudence and discretion. The, the book of Proverbs were God's instruction manual to train young men for wise service in the kingdom of God. And what do the book of Proverbs do? Proverbs introduces themselves in chapter 1, verse 4, by saying they are designed to what? To give prudence to the simple and knowledge and discretion to the youth. What does Daniel have? Well, Daniel has in verse 14 of Daniel chapter 2, then Daniel replied with what? Prudence and discretion. His paideia was the paideia of God. His education was the education of God. And it's in the minute that the crisis hits that the true education rises. The ones who have taught, been taught to think clearly in accordance with Scripture, built on the foundation of the fear of the Lord, it is in that moment of crisis that everything else melts. The ones who have been undergirding their entire existence by faith in God and learning to think the way that God wants them to think, that's at the moment they rise and everything else melts. Look, do you want to know what the way of the future is in this country? The one that we live in? I don't think it's, at this point in history, I don't think it's less crises. I think it's more crises. And ever, every time there's a crisis, guess what's going to happen? The wisdom of God's word will show itself to be true and will gain credibility and credibility and credibility and credibility. And the lies that have underpinned this entire society for several generations now will melt and show themselves to be hot air. Just melt, they'll vaporize. Because you can't fight the natural way of existence, God's law. I mean, the, the parliament could decree that there's no such thing as gravity if they wanted to. But that would be a pretty useless thing to do. Parliament could pass a motion this week and they could say, we decree, we pass this motion that the tides on the west coast may no longer go in and may no longer go out. They're useless though. They're fighting nature. And with all their other stupid, foolish laws, they're also fighting nature. Because it is only the wisdom of God that will prevail when the crisis hits. And Daniel's God prevails with prudence and discretion, shrewdness to calculate a situation before acting. Daniel was trained in the ancient paideia of Israel, the education of Israel, sensing that this life and death moment, the greatest moment for which he had faced up until now, 
requires him to be calculated and careful and operate in accordance with the fear of the Lord. And with that fear of the Lord, with a cool head, maintaining composure, no panic, as a true leader, he remains focused and with it under pressure because his eyes are fixed upon the immovable God He addresses the captain of the king's guard, which could also be translated the chief butcher or the chief executioner. And in his presence, the presence of the chief butcher or executioner, Daniel is confident and Daniel is calm. And Daniel poses the the obvious question in verse 5. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, the chief butcher or executioner, why is the decree of the king so urgent? That's a good question. He, up until now, you can see he's been kept out of the loop. He hasn't risen to prominence yet, but he's about to. What's going on here? Like, I thought we were in this educational system, and the king really valued what we had to say, and now he wants us all dead? He's invested all this time in us? I don't get it. So it's an obvious question. He, he didn't realize anything. He didn't know what the king's dream was. He wasn't aware. And why is he all of a sudden implicated in this? And so we asked the obvious question. Verse 16 or verse 15, he, he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. So Arioch fills Daniel in on everything that's transpired so far in Daniel 2. Daniel didn't know. He wasn't invited to the party. He was in the dark. And so at, at the end of verse 15, now Daniel knows. Oh, that's what it is. Well, I got a solution for that, he thinks. And quickly... He boldly requests an audience with Nebuchadnezzar in verse 16. It says, Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Now, this is very bold. Because Daniel just actually figured out what is going on. So how does he even know what the dream is? He doesn't. He didn't even know the situation that provoked the crisis. He didn't even know about the crisis till it came for his head. So he certainly doesn't know about the dream. But then he says, hey, I want to meet with the king and I want to tell him the dream and, and, and interpret the dream. You, so what, what did we learn about Nebuchadnezzar and the wicked? Proverbs 28, verse 1. The wicked flee when no one pursues. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is haunted by his dreams. Like, really? But what does the other half of Proverbs 28, verse 1 say? The righteous are as bold as a lion. And this is a very bold move on Daniel's part. Daniel learns what's going on. Daniel assesses what's going on. And Daniel comes up to a solution and is going to do what the experts can't do. He's going to reveal the dream and interpret it. But there's a problem. Daniel doesn't know what the dream is at this point. Without divine intervention, he's not going to find out what the dream is. And Nebuchadnezzar has threatened to rip off their limbs and bulldoze their homes if they don't explain what the dream is and what the dream means. And so Daniel is offering to explain what the dream is and what the dream means, but he doesn't know what the dream is, and he sure doesn't know what the dream means. So he's going to be in double trouble when Nebuchadnezzar finds out that he doesn't know what the dream is and doesn't know what the dream means. He's in big trouble. He's setting himself up for trouble. But he's ready to explain it, and he's ready to recount it. So all the best to Daniel in this. And the only thing that's going to save Daniel at this particular moment in time is the mercy of God. The wisdom of God. And so what does Daniel do? Well, Daniel goes to prayer. Verse 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. He calls his three friends And he asks them to beg God for mercy and save them in this moment. What a beautiful picture of faith. Psalm 145, verse 18 through 20, which we will actually close the service with today after the sermon, says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. God is using the crisis to destroy the wicked magicians and exalt the godly. 
And Daniel sees it. He assesses the moment. He knows what time it is. And it's time for God to exalt the valleys and lower the mountains. And this is that moment. God is now going to exalt the valleys and lower the mountains. But Daniel knows that if God is going to exalt the valleys and lower the mountains, it is the duty of God's people to cast themselves on the mercy of God and pray. And how many of you, when you are in the moment of crisis, wherever you face yourself, your first instinct is the instinct of Daniel here, and that is to get on your knees and to beg God for mercy and to get your friends to beg God for mercy on your behalf? How many? Or how many are quick to use the arm of the flesh? He didn't consult the magicians of Babylon. He didn't consult their textbooks. He didn't consult their learning. He didn't go to his professors in the Babylonian school of education. He got on his knees and he begged God for mercy. How many here have the same instincts as Daniel? How many would just say, I'm going to compromise. I'm going to figure something out. I'm going to use my intellect. I'm going to employ the strong arm of the flesh. I'm going to go to my Babylonian professors. I'm going to try and politically manipulate my way through the Babylonian court. Not Daniel. Not Daniel. First instinct, get on your knees and beg God for mercy. And that's what he tells his friends to do. When trouble comes your way, what are your instincts? That's what I'm asking you this morning. You know, we have access to God in Christ through prayer. All of heaven's riches are open to us, just like that vision that Jacob saw as he, as he entered, as he left the land of Canaan, of the ladder going into heaven, the angels coming up and down the ladder. What does that vision tell us? That all of heaven's treasures are available to us in Jesus Christ. And he is the key to unlock all of earth's mysteries by simply getting on his knees and begging God for mercy. And so this is what he does. And, and by the way, as I look at this text, do you know what I stand in awe of? Daniel has friends who pray. And Don, Daniel doesn't just have friends who pray. Daniel has friends who he is confident that if they pray, God will answer their prayers. Do you have friends like that? I didn't ask you if you have friends who pray. I, have, I asked you if you have friends who when they pray, God answers their prayers. That's what I asked you. Are you one of those friends? You, you know, if those of you who are single and you're looking to marry someone, do you know one of the things that you should look for in a spouse? Has God answered his or her prayers? That's a really good question to ask. If you're looking for a church, that's a good question to ask. Does God hear the prayers of this church? And, and if you're trying to surround yourself with godly people and build godly relationships as you should, with good Christian people. One of the questions that you can determine you know, whether they're good Christian people is simply to ask the question, does God answer their prayers? Are these people who have seen heaven move after they've got on their, their knees and begged God for mercy? Are these those types of people? Because those are the types of people that you want to be around. The people whose prayers God hears. That is a sign of God's favor on, on their lives. One of Daniel's greatest assets is not only that he prays to heaven, but he has friends that pray to heaven, and not only that he has friends that pray to heaven, but these are people whose prayers God hears. God lends his ear to them. Matthew Henry said, praying friends are valuable friends. I hope you have praying friends that are valuable friends. William Gouge said, it is the best duty that one could perform for another and the least to be neglected. Speaking of prayers for your friends. And so they get on their knees and they beg God for mercy. And in verse 19, all is well. All is well. Look at verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Wow. Wow. Do you imagine the pressure that he felt in that moment? I'm going to have my limbs ripped off unless God answers this prayer. I'm going to have my house destroyed. All my friends are going to have their limbs ripped off. And what will come to the witness of God in the Babylonian court? Are you concerned for your marriage? You should pray. That's one of the first things I ask when people come to me and they say they need marriage counseling. Are you praying? Are you praying together? Or they have problems with their children. Are you praying for your children? Are you praying as a family do you hold your hands together and get on your knees and beg God for mercy every night? That, that should be our first ask, question that we ask anyone that has a problem in their life. Do you pray? 
Are you concerned about our nation and you see the news and it really bothers you what's going on and what's going on in Parliament even this past week with some of the absolutely ridiculous tyrannical laws that they're trying to pass? Does this really trouble you? Well, do you pray? Did you come to the prayer meeting this week on Wednesday night? Some of you did. Do you gather with your church and pray? When there's a call to pray that goes out to the church of Jesus Christ to intercede on behalf of these events, do you pray? Are you willing and ready to get on your knees and beg God for mercy? And if you say, no, I am not ready and willing, then I have to ask you the question, do you even believe there's a God in heaven who hears your prayers? This was the greatest asset of Daniel and his friends as they entered the courts of Babylon, as they believed is that there was a God in heaven who heard their prayers. There was a God who showed mercy to his people. The gods of the Babylonians would not answer them. But the God of, Jew, of Judea, the God of the Jews, our God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, lent his ear to his people as they enlisted the prayers of each other, and Daniel enlisted the prayers of his friends, and they labored in prayer. The whole story pivots on their prayers. It all pivots on that. With all the experts in Babylon, the best experts that money could buy, they couldn't solve the problem, but four simple Hebrews, Daniel and his three friends, got on their knees and they begged God for mercy, and all their problems went away in an instant. They had access to heaven's throne by prayer. And it wasn't even their tool of last resort. It was the first tool they went to. So you should pray in your homes. Pray with your families, pray with your wife, pray with your husband, pray with your children, pray in your church. The, the prayers of God's people should be common in their homes. Pray in private. When, when you enter into a difficult situation and you're facing a challenge, what's the first thing you do? You should shoot a quick arrow up to heaven in prayer. Just right there. You should breathe prayers. They should come out of your body as naturally as your breath comes out of your body when you breathe. Straight to heaven you go with your prayers. Pray. What a wonderful thing that God's people have access to his throne through prayer. Beautiful. All of this comes to its head. And what happens is God shows that he is exalted above Nebuchadnezzar, exalted above Nebuchadnezzar's educational system, exalted above Nebuchadnezzar's dominion and his authority and his kingdom, and exalted above all of his wisdom, and he's exalted above all of this. Why? Because there were four young Hebrew boys who were trained by their mothers and fathers to pray, and now the training to prayer that, pray that was modeled by their mothers and fathers, no doubt, in the Jewish courts, was coming into effect, and they were doing what their parents taught them to do in Judea, and they were going to God in prayer. The most important thing, more important than any, any knowledge and any books that your children read in school, more important than any of that, is that you teach them that their first instinct should be to pray, to go to heaven with prayers. Because we have access to all of God's riches when we go to God in prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the prayers of your people and that you hear them. And we pray that you would hear our prayers. Teach us to be a praying people, that heaven would be open to us as we bang on heaven's door and seek and find. And you would honor these passages of scripture that you've taught us that are deep in your word, that you do hear our prayers and you do answer our prayers. And when we come to you, you answer us. And we thank you for this model of of Daniel and his friends in this Babylonian court that you heard their prayers. Oh, would we follow this example and would you please likewise hear our prayers and teach us to pray even as you taught them to pray. And it's in Christ's name that we pray.